All right. Let's see. Should be getting this here in a moment. Sometimes it's very slow going out. I apologize. No, no worries. <laughs> there it is. All right. The notification has been sent out. What's up, everybody? Uh, as you can see, we have started early. Surprise, surprise. That's a first, right? Usually people start late, but nope. Today, surprise, we're starting early. Uh, today, I am joined by Janae Marie Kroc. Thank you so much for being here. This is really an exciting opportunity. Um, yeah, thanks so much for being here. Would you like to introduce yourself to the audience? Sure. Um, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. For the people out there that aren't familiar with me, um, I'm transgender, but I also um, identify as non-binary and gender fluid, and we can talk more about that later and what that means. Okay. Um, my background's rather unusual compared to most trans women. I'm a, I'm a U.S. Marine, um, a former world champion and world record holding power lifter, and um, I basically grew up in a super masculine world and was your stereotypical um, jock type, you know, football, mm -hmm. wrestling, baseball, and started lifting weights at age nine. Um, I have three uh, sons that I'm very close to and have an amazing relationship with. They're uh, 18, 20, and 22. And right. um, a few years ago, I was outed publicly, and there was a documentary made about that. Some of you may have seen it. It's called Transformer, and it's on Netflix for those of you in the U.S. And it basically documents everything that happened in the two years after I was outed publicly. Okay, very cool, very cool. Um, just really quickly to clarify for the audience, we're already getting some very stupid comments from people who very have not been following this at all. Um, yeah. Janae, obviously you were thrown into some unwanted controversy after Blair White uh, spread misinformation that you compete against biological females, um, which is not true. Uh, as you've made very clear, you've been very vocal about the fact that you compete against men. So would you want to elaborate a little bit on that before we jump into the actual like Blair White drama? Yeah, yeah. I'm not actually competing anymore. Um, okay. I started competing in my teens, competed in high school, competed in the Marines, and then I competed professionally for about 20 years. Um, slowly worked my way from the local level to the national level to the world level and eventually reached my all-time goal of breaking the all-time world record in my weight class. At, uh, in the 220-pound weight class, I squatted 1,014 pounds, bench pressed 738, and deadlifted 810. And wow. at that time, it was the all-time world record. Yeah. I have to say, that is, that's really impressive considering I have a hard time lifting like anything over 25 pounds. So very, very impressive. <laughs> That's absolutely like, yeah. insane. Yeah, that, that's yeah, crazy. But, yeah, but all of that, and I think a lot of people probably get confused when they hear that I'm trans and I was a power lifter. They're thinking that, I'm, that these records were set against women, and they were not. This was all prior to me coming out, and um, while I was competing in the men's division, I've never competed against women, and I have no intention to. I've been very vocal about that, and, um, and that's what's frustrating when people like Blair get things wrong and then use me as an example and I think it really skews the whole conversation and, and it's just blatant misinformation. So exactly. it's unfortunate, but we, you know, we'll talk all about, you know, why, why I've decided to make those choices and, and why I don't feel like it's fair for me to compete. And then how, um, actually I've done a lot of research on trans athletes and I can share what I found out and, and how I feel about all of that. Yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, it definitely is really upsetting to see people, um, like Blair kind of spreading this misinformation and using you as this example of like someone who has an unfair advantage or something when that's just not true. That's really like, I feel like that kind of chips away from the significance uh, um, of your achievements. So the fact, you know, that she spread that misinformation, I can, I can totally agree. I can totally recognize how harmful that really would would have been. So why don't we just jump right into that? I mean, that's obviously kind of what <laughs> what's really everyone's kind of thinking about right now is the fact that Blair White, she spread misinformation about you. Now, I do want to make it clear for the viewers, uh, Blair has since deleted the video three weeks later and nearly half a million views later. Um, she deleted it, so credit where credit's due. She also has posted a apology on her Twitter. We're going to go over that shortly. But First, Janae, what happened when Blair made that video? Did you, I know you talked about getting a lot of hate, but would you want to give any more detail about 
the negative consequences of having just misinformation spread about you like this. Yeah, well, the really hard thing, this isn't the first time I've had things like this happen. I mean, for someone who anyone, anyone who's looking, you know, for clickbait or for shock value, I, I'm low hanging fruit, right? It's I'm still big and muscular. I was extremely muscular in the past. You throw some pictures of me up there and put trans athlete. And especially when you do something misleading, like she did with the title. And then I believe underneath my photo, it said something along the lines of, I'm um, I'm a trans athlete and I compete with women, get over it. Yeah. As if those were my own words, and which of course is not something I would ever say. So very misleading. And the thing is, you never truly know the damage, right? Like immediately mm -hmm. all of my social media accounts were getting flooded with hateful messages, you know, you know, calling me all kinds of things and, and talking about how, you know, I'm, I'm cheating out real women and all this kind of stuff. And, and I didn't know where any of this was coming from. And like I said, it's not the first time something's happened like this, but this is definitely one of, you know, as far as like exposure and stuff, one of the most prominent people that have done this. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so like my accounts start getting flooded with all these hateful messages. And right away I recognize that, okay, so something went up about me somewhere. There was an article written, there was a video made, and they right. you know, used me and, you know, they're claiming that I'm competing because I could, from the nature of the messages, they were all about, you know, me competing in women's sports. And, um, mm -hmm. but then some of my followers, you know, contacted me and I started getting messages and saying, Hey, Blair White put a video up about you. Have you seen it yet? And so I went over and watched the video and I was just like, Oh man. And, right. and, the, and the crazy thing is, is she had taken you know, a lot of stuff off of my social media. So she obviously took the time to go to my social media, but apparently didn't bother to really read any of it. Mm -hmm. And even like one of the posts she used and talked about, like right in that post talked about the fact that I've never competed against women and have no intention of doing that. Right. So really, you know, just kind of careless. And, but the thing is the damage you don't know, you know, there, all those people that see the video initially never saw like all the comments later about people defending me. I mean, I'm very thankful for all of my fans and the people that know me and follow me and have followed me in the powerlifting world, you mm -hmm. know, pre-transition and then after the documentary and, you know, everything going on now, I, I did have a lot of support and I really appreciate those people. They came over and were commenting like crazy on her video, like, hey, this is wrong. Janae's been right. very vocal about this. But right. a lot of those people that see the video will never see those comments and never be aware of that. Right. All they know is they've seen that, they assume that's true. And then if my name ever comes up or they see my image, they'll be like, oh yeah, I remember her you know, she's that one that she's that cheater. She's the one that lifts against all those girls. Right. And, um, and then you never know, like I, and now like I'm a pharmacist by trade, but now I make my career speaking and writing and educating. Mm -hmm. Well, you never know like how many lost opportunities they may, may be. Like maybe there was a, you know, someone that was considering me being a speaker sees that video or catches wind of that stuff mm -hmm. and then never contacts me or, you know, cancels something. And I would never know. See, right. it's really difficult to determine how much damage is done and how that affects your reputation and how that affects future opportunities. And, yeah. you know, especially when something like that is up for weeks and, you know, you're talking like half a million people seeing it and you don't know how many people, that, you know, people talk to people and word spreads. And right. you know, so it, it's really difficult to ascertain how much damage was actually done. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can totally understand that. I, I I've like never in, in, uh, the same way, but I've definitely received like large amounts of hate for other reasons online before also. And it can be pretty stressful. Uh, and I can definitely assume how stressful it would have been just because you're getting hate based on nothing. You're like, wait, I, I'm not, I didn't do what I'm being accused of doing. And you know, it's funny how you talk about how Blair didn't really do enough research. And yeah, I, I, that post that she even showed on her video, uh, I don't know if she did it on purpose. I don't know if it was malicious, but the fact that she like cropped out the part of your post where you made it very clear that, Hey, I don't compete against females here. Um, and the fact you sort of cropped that out and kind of ran with the narrative, uh, I can definitely understand the sort of damage that that would have done. So I am really sorry that that happened. I mean, um, I know you saw my video Blair has unfortunately done this kind of thing before, uh, this seems to be the most, like, uh, uh, I think, prominent uh, figure that she has lied about, which is good. I'm glad that you called her out. I'm glad a lot of people did rally rally behind you and, and came to support you. Um, but Blair White has done this kind of thing a lot. I mean, she's falsely accused people even of being, like, predators and stuff. So she has kind of a history here of 
levying these false accusations or at least at at minimum levying these claims that she just has no basis in that she hasn't researched uh and it's just really unfortunate that you were sort of victimized by her lack of research um and you're right the fact that she kind of took your photos and put them on the thumbnail and then kind of i feel like she sort of took some of your uh before photos also and tried to like use it to sensationalize the concept of trans people. And I don't know, I, I want to know, I know this wasn't really on our script here, but I would love to know your opinion on as, you know, a trans person, Blair is also a trans person, but I personally think that despite the fact that she's trans, I think Blair White is extremely transphobic. I think she doesn't like trans people. I think she's uncomfortable by trans people. How do you feel about that? What do you think? You know, it, it's it, it's really hard to say. I mean, the only person that knows what's going on in her mind is her, right? And I don't want to speak for her. Um, but at the same time, judging by her actions, it, it's really difficult to understand why someone spends, you know, a lot of time, um, you know, posting and talking about negative parts of her own community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so you wonder if there's some internalized stuff going on there. Or And, and I don't want to play armchair psychologist and try to guess at what's going on with her. Right. But community you know it's a very marginalized community we, we you know there's a lot of girls that are subject to a lot of violence and people don't realize like every you know every month we're having trans girls getting murdered and it's just for existing just for the fact that people that, i mean there was you know something that some people might have saw just like a month or two ago where three trans girls in hollywood were literally followed down the street beaten robbed and a crowd of people instead of helping them stood around and laughed and mocked them and all of them filmed it and put it up on their social media. Yeah. So that's like, I mean, who would do that? Like watch another human being being beaten and driven to the street. And yeah. I think at one point, one of them was struck with a crowbar and, and people are literally laughing at them Yeah. You know, and they're screaming for help. And you know, it, it's crazy, but, but that's the world we live in. And when you do things like this and spread misinformation, it just causes more hate against an already marginalized community. Right. And that hate leads to violence. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's more than just, you know, somebody being, you know, sensitive and, you know, you see all the memes with being triggered and sensitive snowflakes and stuff like that. And I'm not saying there isn't anyone that's, you know, does maybe take things a little too harsh, but the reality mm -hmm. of this is, is this leads to really, you know, tragic outcomes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's something I, I think that gets glossed over a little too much. And, and, and as far as what's going on with Blair and why she does so many videos about the trans community you know, who knows? It, it, you know, mm -hmm. um, obviously it's popular with her viewers. She gets a lot of views for it. It's, you know, controversial, um, but, it, but it's really unfortunate, you know, for yeah. anyone, you know, to, to, you know, pick on a group like that, especially when you belong to that group and, and, um, you know, say like really negative things and that's how you generate your views and everything. I, I mean, it, mm -hmm. it's difficult for me to understand. I, I can't understand where she's coming from. Yeah. You know, I, I uh, it, it's kind of interesting. Like she is, such a prominent trans figure at this point um you'd think that she would want to do some good for the community also especially as like she's experienced like gender dysphoria she's experienced transphobia she's experienced discrimination so you'd think that she would want to try and do good for her community and you know i think that there's still room to criticize some aspect like of course oh, there are going to be some, some crazy people in that like in the LGBT yeah. community or whatever. And if Blair wants to criticize those people, I don't really have a problem with that, but it's more yeah. the fact that, like you said, it's almost like she's attacking the trans community. And you're right. A lot of people, they, they, especially a lot of people on the, the farther right area, I guess, or maybe even the people who follow Blair, they oftentimes uh, fear monger about trans people when, like you said, it's actually the other way around. Like trans people are so frequently victimized, and they're they're um so frequently uh, a victim of violent crime, etc. So, the uh, yeah. the sorry, go ahead. No, I'm just I was just gonna say that um yeah, it's under it's hard to understand what's going on there and what motivates that and and um but like I was, but like a point I always make about trans people too. Yes, there are terrible trans people out there. 
There's what it's like any other community. Yeah, look right? at Blair. Yeah. There's, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, uh, there's, I mean, some of us are really good, great people that are, you know, loving and intelligent and do all kinds of amazing things in the world. And some of us are horrible people. It's like any other community. Mm -hmm. So there is room for people to be called out. And there is, you know, and there, there is stuff to be talked about. And there is criticism that people should be open to. And some of it's legitimate. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. And that, and those things should be talked about. But when you go and you're like, you know, basically, you know, unintentionally or intentionally falsifying stuff or not doing your homework, not doing your research, you, you're making a problem of, you know, something that's a significant problem already even worse. And, right. and the thing is people don't understand too, like the trans community has been misrepresented pretty much, you know, for the last several decades. Mm -hmm. If you think about like how they're viewed, like in Hollywood, how we come across, I mean, who do you, who do you see when there's any, like a trans character, you right. see Buffalo Bill from Silence of the Lambs. You know, you have things like Ace Ventura, and yeah, it's a comedy, and it might seem funny and all that stuff, but but think about what happens. If anybody who's seen the movie, when, when he finds out, you know, and of course the villain in that movie is the one who turns out to be trans, but he vomits, he pukes, he's sucking his face with a plunger, and yeah, it's a comedy, and it's supposed to be funny, but really, what message is that sending, that the idea of touching a trans woman is so disgusting that everyone vomits and all this stuff, and then like right. Buffalo Bill, you have this serial killer you know, who's, you know, obviously very mentally deranged and it's, but that kind of stuff's been depicted over and over again. And there are yeah. very few positive role models of trans people in the media that people see. So if you don't know a trans person personally, and that's your only exposure to them, of course, you're going to have a negative opinion. Of course, you're going to think negative things. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if I didn't, if I wasn't this way where I grew up and I grew up in a small town in Northern Michigan, I wouldn't understand it. And I would think, you know, and if you don't understand and you haven't met people and realize that trans people are people just like everyone else. And like I said, you know, we come from all different walks of life, all different levels of education and all different types of people that you, it's easy to see why people would think like, oh, this person's got to be mentally ill. They've got to be crazy. They've got to be nuts. There's got to be something mm -hmm. wrong with them. You know, I can understand that. So if we're not visible, we don't talk about these things. We don't put ourselves out there. There's no way to change this narrative. And, mm -hmm. But the sad part is there is so much violence and there is so much discrimination that the majority of the trans community is invisible. I know I have so many friends and I know so many people that after they transition, if they're what we call passable in the community, meaning that they um, are seen by cis people, people outside the trans community, you know, you would just think it's another, you know, any other girl or any other guy. Mm -hmm. And those people that blend in, which a lot of trans people do, yeah. They, no one has any idea they're trans. They often move, start their life over, start new jobs, and they don't tell anyone because they're afraid of violence, because they're afraid of discrimination. Right. So it's much easier for them just to blend in society. But the problem is then they're invisible. Nobody knows they're trans. All their friends and everyone they associate has no idea that this good friend of theirs is a trans person. Right. And so it's hard to change those, you know, those ideas and that narrative because so much of our community is invisible. Right, right, right. Yeah, you know, it's it's also kind of uh, um, interesting about like the fact that yeah, a lot of people don't even realize sometimes when someone is trans, and that's kind of a good response that I'm seeing in some of the stuff in the chat. People are are definitely still a little confused here, but um, a lot of the times, you know, like conservatives will say stuff like, "Well, it's based on uh, your chromosomes or this or that." It's like no, when you walk into a crowded place or if you walk into a restaurant you don't look at someone's genitals or someone's chromosomes to determine if they are a man or a woman you look at how they identify themselves and how they express themselves and you go based on that so the fact that trans people are sometimes able to blend in uh is almost a testament to the the fluidity i'd say of gender um but i i also understand what you're saying is that it's really sad that they feel the need to blend in or else they might be met with legitimate violence or even death. Yeah. I mean, that's really, really horrific and terrible. And for a marginalized community to be dealing with that, and then to have someone like Blair White, who has the opportunity to really, she can like call out aspects or the crazy members of the LGBT community. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, um, I feel like Blair White, especially, she'll take the the crazy trans people or whatever and use those as like this is what the lgbt community is but i'm one of the good trans i'm not like the other one i'm not like those crazy ones and that's a lot of the times why blair white is criticized because she sort of tries to take this like pick me i'm not like the other girls approach uh and that does legitimate harm to her own community so 
I'm I'm confused. I I know, like you said, I don't I don't want to get all armchair psych psych uh, psychologist on her either. No one really knows what's going on in her head or, or what's in her heart. But I do think that she probably has some serious internalized something or another. She probably has some self hatred. She she should work through. Um, but after the drama, Blair White has since apologized. Um, I know that you looked over the apology. I'm gonna really quickly read the apology for the viewers who are here. Um, so for everyone watching, um, Blair White, after getting so much pressure from so many people, uh, finally took the video down and issued an apology on her Twitter. So I'm gonna go ahead and read the apology quickly for everyone here. And then uh, Janae, we can kind of talk about your perception on this um, and we'll talk about what people are saying and everything. So. Blair tweets, uh, hey everyone, in a recent video, I made the error of assuming and stating that a trans athlete named Janae competes against both men and women in her sport. As she made clear, that is false. Unlike many other trans athletes, she insists on only competing against men. For this and any other detail I got wrong about her story, I'm very sorry. I made the mistake of not doing enough research and taking rumors about her at face value, which is something I complain about happening to me. I want to be very clear that this was a fuck up on my part and I take full and total responsibility for any negativity that she's experienced because of that. I also want to be clear that while many are running with the narrative that it was an intentional deception on my part, that's just not true. It was due to less than thorough research, nothing more and nothing less. I've reached out personally and apologized for the error and have deleted the video. I feel pretty terrible and have decided to take a break from social media and YouTube, which actually didn't really turn out to be true because she just posted another video today on her second channel, but whatever. The grind of doing content from us five years and putting immense pressure on myself to constantly release things has resulted in me being sloppy with this last video and I don't want to come back to doing videos until I can guarantee this type of mistake doesn't happen again. I hope everyone understands where I'm coming from with this. And once again, I offer my sincerest apology to Janae above everything else. I've also offered to send Janae the AdSense money I made on the video and I'm awaiting her acceptance of that. It seems only fair. Uh, right off the bat, I actually can respect that that Blair offered to send you the AdSense money. Now, this is getting met with some pretty mixed response. Some people are saying like, hey, Blair's just a human. She makes mistakes, whatever. As I kind of demonstrated in my video, I don't think this is just a one-time mistake though. Um, other people are saying, well, it's not good enough. She should have posted the apology on YouTube because that's where she initially spread the misinformation. What's your perception on her apology? Do you accept her apology? How do you feel about all that? Yeah. Um, well, of course, I accept her apology, and I, I sincerely appreciate that she did make the effort to, you know, issue an apology, that she posted it publicly, that she pulled the video down. I, I greatly appreciate all those things. Um, you know, would it have been nice to have it happen sooner? And, you know, I mean, I reached out to her as soon as I was made aware of the video. I sent her private messages on, you know, all the different forms of social media. You know, we emailed um, her directly. And um, she did reply to me, which I just saw a little bit ago, and I, I haven't had a chance to reply to her yet. Um, but she replied to one of the messages I sent through Instagram and, you know, mm -hmm. pretty much said just what she said there. She apologized for the mistakes said she's, you know, you know, sincerely sorry. And, um, you know, so real similar wording to all that. And, and I haven't messaged her back, but I, I will uh, probably tonight after we get done with this. I mean, I do accept her apology. I do appreciate it. I appreciate she took the video down and, you know, that she did it publicly. Um, it, it more than anything, what I hope comes out of this is, is I hope that, you know, she is more careful in the future. Like you said, I'm not the only person this has happened to. And for me, I'm a strong person. I can handle this. You know, fortunately, like I have a strong fan base and the people supported me, they know me. And, um, but I, I've been through a lot in my life, so I can handle, you know, a lot of this where there's a lot of other people that are going to be more vulnerable and would have, you know, this would have been much more difficult on them. And a lot of people, you know, really struggle already. And then having to deal like with this kind of public hate is is very very difficult. Um, like I said, I you know ultimately I appreciate her apology. I do accept it. More than anything, what I hope comes out of it is that she's just much more careful about this in the future, and that right. hopefully it doesn't happen again to anyone else. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's very respectful. Um, you know, I, I'm actually seeing a lot of people in the chat here also saying that's that's really respectful, and and I'm sure Blair will appreciate the fact that you have accepted her apology. Um, but I agree. I hope that she does better next time, and that it also doesn't take her. I hope that if she ever makes a mistake like this again, it doesn't take her so long to clarify. Um, but what is your opinion on trans sports in general? Because that is certainly a controversial issue. 
Mm -hmm. Well, this is actually something I've done a lot of research on, and not just because I'm an athlete, and not just because I'm trans, but this is something like, I'm a pharmacist, I think I mentioned by trade, and I, I have a very science-based mind, and I'm a very, um, I try to be very rational and very logical, and, you know, I, I try to go into, one of the things I try to abide by is, um, you know, be concerned with what is right, not who is right. Um, so the thing is with this issue, unfortunately, like a lot of things in our society right now, it's become very politicized, right? So like people that are on the right feel pressure to be against it, no matter what, no matter what evidence there is, it's wrong. It's, you know, biological men competing against women, end of story. And then the people, a lot of times people that are hard on the left, they feel like, well, we have to support this hundred percent, no matter what. And that's that. And so, you know, like a lot of things it's become so polarized. That if you're on one side of the fence, you hate it. If you're on the other side of the fence, you 100% support it. And like most issues, it's a lot more complicated than that. It isn't mm -hmm. that simple. And um, like I said, this is something I actually know a lot about. I've done a lot of research. I've spoke to a lot of the experts in these fields. And I have, you know, I have a science background myself. And having been a powerlifter and bodybuilder for 20, 30 plus years, I understand the hormones really well. I understand athletics. I understand muscle building. But here, so here's the reality of it. So the reality is that okay so hormones transitioning do have a significant effect as far as um decreasing muscle mass gain in body fat basically decrease in athletic performance i'll be the first to say we do need more studies we need studies in greater numbers we need longer term studies and we're going to get that as more trans athletes come out and um and we have more cases to go on but based on the research right now so most of the research has come on uh, middle distance runners mm -hmm. and um so on average, we see about 11 to 12 percent difference between um, male and female runners, you know, and average times at the same percentile. And interestingly enough, after one year on estrogen with suppression of testosterone. So you need two things. Mm -hmm. You need replacement with estrogen to bring them into a normal female range. And you need the testosterone either eliminated um, through if, if, if someone has, you know, what we often call bottom surgery, which would be gender confirmation surgery. And for those that don't understand or aren't familiar with that terminology, that would be basically creating a neo-vagina and, um, you know, removing the other tissue and removing the testicles. And then sometimes people have what's called an orchiectomy, which is removal of the testicles, the same thing. So that's, that produces the majority of testosterone in a, in a um, cis male body. But there's a small amount made from the adrenal gland, so it'll be very low levels. But a trans woman, after having one of those surgeries, actually has lower testosterone levels than a cis woman does because cis women produce a small amount from their ovaries. But um, so what we see, it takes time. It takes time for the, the body fat accumulation. It takes time for the muscle loss. But after about one year, in this, in this study um, indicated this very clearly with the runners, they're their de performance decreased about 11 to 12 percent and for runners that were say where the 80th percentile is males a year later and after that found themselves in the 80th percentile as females so they were no better as a female athlete than they were as a male athlete after this time now and like you said we do need more studies especially on strength athletes and things like that where you would assume a um a cis male who transitions especially later in life is going to have more of an advantage and, um, but so here's some other, here's some other, and I, I like to stay, try to stay away from like guessing or supposing, and let's talk about what we actually know and what has actually happened. Mm -hmm. So, so far with the Olympics, the Olympics have allowed trans athletes to compete since 2004. Um, there was something known as the Stockholm consensus, which took place in 2003. And at that time it was a two year wait, wait, wait period after, you know, suppressing testosterone. And, um, and then supplementing with estrogen. And, and granted, now surgery is not required by the Olympic IOC anymore, or nor does the NCAA, but there is, so there's hormonal ways of suppressing testosterone too, if someone hasn't had surgery yet, or maybe doesn't want the surgery because of the risks involved. But either way, the testosterone levels have to be brought down and it does take time. But um, so anyway, so in 2004, the Athens games, that was the first year trans women were allowed to compete. And there was a huge outcry then, Women's sports are over, the you know, trans people are going to come in and dominate. Well, so every Olympics since 2004, trans women have been able to compete. What people don't understand is there have been no gold medals. There have been no world records broken. There have been no medals of any kind. And actually, no trans woman has even successfully made an Olympic team for any country. So they've been unable to do that. All the girls that have tried have failed. They have not been able to qualify. 
Um, there, and then you, you know, if you Google this stuff, if you Google trans athletes world records, you're going to get a whole bunch of articles. You're going to get people that come up like Laurel Hubbard, who's an Olympic weightlifter from New Zealand. You're going to get a powerlifter named Mary Gregory, who's from Virginia. You're going to get all these women that have broken world records as trans women. The, the reality of it is none of it's true. None of these women have broken open world records. The records they've broken, like in Mary, and nothing against Mary or anything, it's not, um, but the record she broke was in a federation called the 100% Raw Federation. This is a very small federation with a very small uh, member group. The world championships that she competed at, I think she had one other person in her class. Her numbers that she posted were half of what the actual women's world records are. Hmm. And so this is where a lot of this misinformation comes from. And Laurel Hubbard, Laurel Hubbard won the Masters Women's World Championships. Um, there, there was a, there's a, a, a trans woman cyclist who, uh, named Veronica Ivey that um, won a Masters, set of master, Masters Women's World Record. These aren't open world records, and these women aren't anywhere close to the best women in the world. Um, in Laurel Hubbard's case, she placed sixth at the Open World Championships, and she was over 150 pounds out of first place, which in Olympic weightlifting is a large margin. So in every sport where you hear about these things, it's something like that. It's a small organization. It's a master's record. It's not in an open. No trans woman has been able to compete with the best cis women in the world in any sport anywhere. It has not happened. And um, in the NCAA, we've had one um, national champion, and that was Cece Telfer. She was a Division II 400-meter um, hurdle winner in 2019. Had she been competing in Division I, she would have placed seventh place. Not to say that isn't significant and that she didn't do well. Um, it's just that she's still, she's not anywhere near the top women her age. You know, like, I mean, she's top 10, but she's not even threatening to be on the podium. And that's where, and, and like I said, there is a big discussion that needs to be had about this. We need more research. We need more stuff done. But what the, the conversations that are being had and the stuff you're seeing on the internet it's just very misleading. It acts like trans women are dominating women's sports and they're breaking all these records. That has not happened. Like I said, there is not a single sport in the entire world where one trans woman has broken a legitimate open world record. None of them are even close. And so, like I said, it's not that, and I'm certainly not saying that, you know, on the other side of the coin, and I don't want to get too far into this and take up all our time here. No, but don't worry about it. High school, high school athletes are, um, are a really hot topic with trans athletes right now. And the problem is there's no standardized rules. So we have some states like Connecticut that as soon as a person identifies as trans, they're allowed to start competing on the women's team or the men's team, whichever they want. And then we have other states like Texas that no matter what you've done with transition, no matter what hormones you're taking, no matter what surgeries you've had, you are stuck competing in the division um, that you were assigned at birth. Well, this has caused problems on both ends. In Connecticut, a lot of people have probably heard there were two girls that won state championships that were sprinters. Yeah. And this actually re resulted in a lawsuit. And, um, but in like my stance on this is we have to have rules. We have to have regulations. And we need to, this needs to be, you know, like I said, like so far, like I said, with the Olympics and the NCAA, the, the rules in place seem to be working. There aren't mm -hmm. trans women are not dominating. So those rules need to be put in place in high school as well. And something needs to be adopted. So there's a standardization across the board. And then if we're seeing, if all of a sudden we're seeing like a, a disproportionate number of trans women winning more than they should be, that's when we need to look at things. And we need to, then we need to make adjustments if that happens. But at this point it hasn't. The, the, and like I said, in Connecticut, it's tricky because we don't know, like, we don't know when these girls started hormones. We don't know how long they've been on hormones. We don't know where their hormone levels are maintained. So we don't know, like, if they are if they are adhering to the same criteria that you would see in the Olympics or in college. And it's interesting to note that one of the girls, particularly the faster one, her senior year, her times dropped off significantly. And in one of the events that she had won the state championship the year before, she placed 13th. She didn't even qualify for the finals. Now, is that a result of her just having been on hormones for a longer period of time? I don't know. I don't know if that's what happened or if there was something else going on, but it is something to, to think about and talk about. And then like with Texas, like I said, the problem they ran into with having this, the rule that once you're assigned, you know, once you have a birth certificate, that's where you're stuck. Well, they had a trans man who transitioned after their sophomore year 
and wanted to compete in the men's division, was competing in the men's division in USA Wrestling, which is like the feeder program to the U.S. Olympic team, and was doing quite well on the national level. But because of the rules in Texas, he was stuck competing against girls and ended up winning two state championships. And, you know, people were really upset, saying this isn't fair, this kid's on testosterone. But it was those rules that were more targeted at trans women that kept him stuck where he didn't even want to compete. So mm. like, like I'm, we have problems on both ends. And like I said, yeah. I, I'm really a proponent of standardized testing and, um, you know, to help balance these things out and follow what we've had in place that seems to be working so far. But like yeah. I said, it's, it's a complicated conversation. There's a lot to talk about. And um, I've been in touch with people that are on that have consulted the Olympic committee and, t- and discuss these issues. So this is something I've been researching for a, a long time. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, but I, I think we need on both ends, you know, we need to have a conversation and talk about this and see what is the best way to handle this. And, and like I said, and as new information emerges, as more trans people are competing and doing so openly, then, you know, we change things if we need to. And, right. um, but the idea that trans girls are going out there and smashing all these records, it has not happened. It isn't happening. And I, I think that's the biggest piece of misinformation and and understand and I understand why people you know like don't assume someone transitioning oh it's not going to make that much difference it's not you know they have this unfair advantage I can understand why people think that way Mm -hmm. and there's not time to hear to go into in depth like why all the reasons what changes and and uh, but like I said the the bottom line is the reality is those things haven't happened Hmm. That is really interesting. I'm definitely going to have to do some more more research into that topic myself. I mean, that's something that I've been pretty interested in as well. Uh, so it's really interesting to hear your perspective in that in that matter. I guess. I mean, that that is really interesting. I, I do also think that, uh, especially a lot of conservative media, makes it seem as if trans people are dominating like girls or whatever. And it's like you're you're right that that just that doesn't seem to be what's happening and hormones can really, really uh, uh, um, kind yeah. of put you in the, the proper level. Um, uh, well, we're going to go ahead and move into the Q and a section. Now chat, everyone, this is now your chance to ask questions. Um, let's keep the questions respectful, please. However, uh, Janae, as you said, you're not easily offended. So guys, if you have something you would like to ask, do so respectfully, and uh, we will we will go ahead and and uh, jump into the Q and A. Also, if you want a guaranteed response, you can put your question into the super chat. Um, but we're also going to be looking at at questions in the regular chat as well. We already have a question here from um, someone who asked, "When did you realize that you were trans?" Um, I knew by the time I was five or six years old. Okay. Um, it was just. One of those things, um, I grew up in a small town, like I said, in northern Michigan, and I knew already at that age that it wasn't okay to tell anyone. And that if I did tell anyone, it was life was not going to be good. I knew I couldn't tell my parents. I knew I couldn't tell my friends. I knew I, I basically knew that this is something I have to hide because it's going to be really bad. So even at that young age, I already was very aware of gender and what was okay for boys and what was okay for girls and the things right. I wanted to do I knew were not okay and um, the thing was back then trans stuff wasn't really talked about there was no social media there was no internet I didn't know that anyone else in the world felt the way I did but I knew by the time I was five or six years old that I felt like I was supposed to be female I didn't know why I didn't know what was going on And, and the thing was too I was raised Catholic and so I was taught to fear God and not only was I carrying all this guilt and shame for feeling this way I, I thought I was sinning and something was wrong with me and mm. like, you know, that I was this horrible person. Why do I feel this way? And no one had any idea. And I hid it for so long out of complete fear. And, yeah. um, you know, it, it tore me apart until I eventually couldn't do it anymore. And it, it drove me to the brink of suicide. And, um, you know, and, and that's the tragic part. Like so many people do go that route and trans people are at a, at a disproportionately high rate of suicide. Like 41% of trans people have attempted suicide. Yeah. And, um, and I, you know, I got to that point as well. You just you look at your life and you say, this is never going to work. How can I ever be who I am and exist in society? Who is going to want to date me? How am I ever going to have a family? Like, this is not going to happen. And you just yeah. feel hopeless. And, you know, you worry about your family rejecting you. And that happens all the time. 
but yeah, I knew very young. I didn't know how to put words to it until much later, but I, I had these feelings of, um, you know, of being misgendered in the wrong gender from a very young age. And, and the interesting thing is I was also passionate about weightlifting from a very young age. And that was even more confusing for me because I was taught to believe that men are, you know, men are strong. Men are the, you know, the ones that want big muscles and everything. So I was like, why am I so into lifting? And, and if I'm, if I feel this way about my gender, but then, you know, I came to realize later in life that a lot of women are passionate about strength sports too. And I just yeah. happened to be one of them. Yeah. Wow. That's very cool. I mean, I guess I would follow that up with another question we have, which is how do you feel about children transitioning? Okay. This is another thing that's been greatly exaggerated as far as like prevalence and how often it's, it's actually very, very difficult for trans people to transition. There's mm -hmm. a ton of restrictions. For example, like even as an adult, you have to have two letters from two different psychologists, both okaying um, just to even start hormones. And then like it's the same thing for surgeries. If you want bottom surgery, um, I mean, some things like breast augmentation, if you have the money, you can get it done. But these things are very expensive, very difficult. And there's a lot of hoops to jump through. There's a lot of restrictions. So this idea, again, that you see online or you see in the media that, oh, there's all these young kids and they're just going on hormones left and right. It's not happening. It hasn't happened in some cases. Sure. I don't know, like, you know, the specific cases. And, and the thing is, too, we have to understand, like, it's not... It's not like this this black and white issue that, you know, like some people, you're either 100% um, female, 100% male, or you identify 100% one way or the other. There, there's different, it's a spectrum and there's different degrees. And like mm -hmm. me, myself, yes, I have a female gender identity. I always feel like I'm supposed to be female, but there are some very masculine aspects to my personality. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, and, and some people, it's more blurry. Some people feel very androgynous. They don't feel like either male or female. Someone like me, I have lots of, masculinity and femininity even though my identity is more female so it, it's it's more complicated than just boom i'm going to transition or boom no i'm not but we have to understand too that some of these kids it is so traumatic for them we have three and four year olds grabbing scissors and trying to cut their penises off because it's so uncomfortable for them so mm -hmm. in those cases sometimes it can be life-saving to allow at the very least the thing is no one's putting kids on hormones before puberty anyway, or should not be, mm -hmm. um, because your body wouldn't introduce them to that point anyway. And, um, and typically, they're not starting till later in their teens. And, um, you know, but there are kids that literally it's life saving to at least allow them to live in the other gender role, you know, allow them right. to dress and integrate in as, you know, because like I said, there are kids that it is so traumatic for them that they're, they're trying to harm themselves even yeah. at three and four years of age saying something's wrong. I'm not, I'm in the wrong body. I'm supposed to be a girl or I'm supposed to be a boy. So there are cases where things do need to happen. Now, are there, you know, it, there's, like I said, it's not just this easy, simple, like boom, do this or boom, do that. Mm -hmm. Every case needs to be handled individually. You know, you see, you know, you see a psychologist, they work through this, they meet with your parents. Like there's, it's a long process. It's not, like I said, this idea that kids left and right are being thrown on hormones is very misleading. In, in the vast majority of cases, it's actually completely the opposite. It's very difficult for their, those, these people to get the help that they need, especially if their parents aren't approving. So the parents can hold that back. And you would not believe the number of messages I get from teenagers that are, you know, in really, really stressed out over all of this and, and their parents but their parents are like, no, you're not going to do that. You're a kid. You don't know what you're talking about. You're, you know, you're going to make a mistake. And I can understand people's concern, not yeah. wanting them to do stuff that could be irreversible and, um, you know, yeah. make choices that they might regret later. But like I said, in some cases, it is very clear. And in other, it's not. And it needs to be handled individually. Um, do I think, you know, six, eight-year-olds should be on hormones? Absolutely not. Because yeah. hormones wouldn't be starting until you're in your early teens anyway. And then at that point, if that person's 100% certain that's what they need, then those are the proper steps. But not everybody's certain at that point. Some trans people don't figure everything out until they're an adult. Right. And there are, you can, what you can do, and there's been a lot of research on this, is if a kid isn't sure but knows they don't like, let's say it's a trans girl and she's not sure what she wants to do or there's some back and forth or you just want to give her more time, you can put her on hormone blockers. That will just delay puberty. And the studies show that if she does change her mind and decide that she does want to go through a male puberty, you can remove the hormone blockers and they'll go through the same type of um, 
of uh, you know uh, maturation during um, you know puberty that they would anyway. It's just delayed later, and the health risks are extremely low. The only thing they found is that late, much later in life, there may be a slight decrease in bone density. And yeah. but it, yeah, and that's but um, so there are other options as far as like blockers. You know, you can delay things, give people more time to figure it out. If like for me, there are certain things like I like being big and muscular, which a lot of people would be very confused about and are confused about. But at the same time, things like facial hair. And when my own hair started to thin as an adult, those were very, very distressing for me. Um, those are things that, you know, that trouble me to this day. And, you know, I got, fortunately, I was not naturally hairy at all. And I didn't, I never was able to grow facial hair and I never wanted to, but any little bit I got was extremely stressful for me. So little steps like that, like getting laser hair removal done or other things, you know, can help. But like I said, it's really an individualized case, but you no, know, people should not be starting children on hormones before they would naturally enter puberty. And, and like I said, even later, it, it's very much a case by case basis. But the idea that this is an easy thing to do and it's widespread happening is very misleading. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I back in like my right wing days, um, I remember seeing a lot of stuff about that too. I mean, even Blair White has, has also talked about like chemically castrating children and everything. Um, and it was kind of the same thing. Like when I actually looked into it, I realized, yeah, wait, people like this is kind of like a conservative narrative here that like kids are just walking into the doctor and they're like, hi, I like the color pink. And they're like, oh, give them a surgery. Like that's yeah. just not what's happening. And there is much more extensive, uh, like yeah. extensive time to go yeah, through. The reality of it, if anything, it's, it's very difficult to, you know, and, it, and it's going to vary different, you know, different therapists make different decisions, but in my case, it, it's not an easy thing. You know, like I, by the time I was, you know, I was a, a, an adult and, you know, had already been through tough. I mean, I had, you know, been through the Marines in college and, you know, had a career, had a family and, you know, was a very stable, successful person, you know, was a, was a um, elite level athlete and all these other things. But yet I, 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 at that point, I really found it demeaning to have to jump through all these hoops and explain to someone else and they have total authority over what I can do to my own body. Yeah. And, that, and that's a completely different scenario and that's another topic. But like I said, if anything, it's, it, it can be extremely difficult to do the things you need to do. It can take a lot of time and a lot of money. And that's the other problem too. I was paying $120 an hour to see these psychologists and all I need, and the only reason I was doing it was to get the things I needed to be able to have access to hormones, to be able to have access to surgeries. It right. wasn't, I didn't feel particularly distressed about other things I was dealing with. What was distressing me was the fact that I wasn't able to do these things. Right, right, right. Um, like I said, that's, that's a whole nother topic. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that sounds like such a, a challenging situation to be in. I mean, I can't even begin to understand. Um, our next question comes from Billy Bob, who says, Janae, what can non-trans people best do to help the trans community? Honestly, just be supportive, um, you know, as far as be respectful when you hear, you know, simple things like when you hear people saying really transphobic things, don't partake. And, you know, if it's possible, you know, basically, you know, talk about the things we've talked about, you know, give that narrative of, hey, look, no, they're not crazy perverts. Like, you know, mm -hmm. you, you know, point them towards my website, point them towards, you know, other responsible trans people and say, hey, look. There are people too. These are the things like this is this isn't really how it is. And then when you meet people in person, just be respectful. And in some cases, you know, some people, some of us, and depending on how I present, I don't look extremely feminine every day. And my hair has thin, so I do wear wigs. And when it's hot in the summertime, I I like to mountain bike. Um, I do jujitsu. I like to swim. I like the beach. I can't wear wigs doing these things. So sometimes I look quite masculine, but I'm someone who blurs those lines. Just ask, you know, if you're not sure on pronouns, you're not sure how a person identifies, ask them politely, ask them, you know, like with respect. Mm -hmm. Just like the thing is, is like doing things like where a lot of people, it's almost become in vogue to, to insist on, um, you know, calling someone by their birth pronouns or whatever. And doing things like that to me, it's just, it's, it's just being a jerk. Like, mm -hmm. in, in, and then using the argument that, well, I'm just going by science or I'm just going by what's true and this and that. Well, first of all, that's like a third grade level understanding of science. We can get into all the reasons why that is. Right. But, right. Um, yeah, that's an oversight, oversimplified, you know, view of biology. The, the, the fact is humans are incredibly complex. There's a ton of diversity and no two humans are alike. So the idea that we all fit neatly in two boxes 
you talk to any advanced biologist and they'll tell you that's absurd. Right. Um, but, uh, um, oh shoot, I forgot where I was going with that, but, um, yeah, no worries. No worries. That's, yeah. that's, I mean, that's a, that's a really good answer. Uh, and I, I really agree with, uh, uh with that as well. Um, we have oh, another, yeah. it was just about being respectful. I was just gonna make the one, the quick example. Go ahead. That yeah. yeah. If, um, you know, like, let's say someone's uh, name, you know, they were named, they had a name at birth that they didn't like, and they asked you to call them by a nickname. No one is going to insist that, no, I'm calling you by your birth name because that's the truth. That's reality. That's who you are. But mm -hmm. of course, they're going to use whatever name you ask them to call by. Same thing with pronouns, same thing with names. If, right. you know, there's some people in my life that still insist on, you know, calling me Matt. That's what, you know, my name was before. And it's just being rude. It's just being a jerk. There's no reason right. for it. You wouldn't do it to someone else. It's just, you know, it's, it's about just being respectful, but right. yeah, be supportive, you know, stand up for people when you can, if there's issues that are being voted on that you feel strongly about and you know um, are going to help or hurt the trans community, exercise your right to vote and, you know, vote against those things or vote for them, you know, right. things like that. And if you want, if you really are passionate about these things, and you want to get involved, there's lots of organizations out there. There's athlete ally, there's, um, you know, lots of LGBT organizations that they love, you know, um, allies to, to join and help with. So if that's something you're passionate about, something you want to help, you know, at the very least, be respectful, be kind. I mean, really, just be a good person. Especially if you see someone getting attacked or harassed or anything, you know, you don't have to put yourself in that way of violence, but do what you can. Call 911, you know, and try to help that person out in any way you can, you know, just... Honestly, it's as simple as being a good person, be kind, be loving, treat them the same way you treat anybody else. Right, right. Very, very good. Very good. I, I heavily agree with that. Um, Digital Cyclone, thank you for the $5 donation. Uh, they say, what transphobe narrative is the worst to you and the most damaging in your opinion? Um, I think one of the most damaging and leads to the most violence is the idea that trans women are out to trick straight men into having sex with them. Hmm. Um, because this is a narrative we hear a lot and like you hear the gay panic defense and this has actually worked in court where guys have beaten trans women to death and their defense was I didn't know they were trans when I found out I panicked and didn't know what to do so I physically beat them to death um, you know and, and when you say it that way it sounds absurd but this has happened lots of times but the, here's the reality of the situation and I found this out very quickly when I when I came out as trans, when I was outed and then subsequently came out, I kind of took control of the situation and did the interviews and owned it and talked about everything openly. Um, what immediately happened, my social media was flooded with messages from men who are straight, um, you know, sexual messages, dick pics, the whole nine yards. There is a very large community of men that identify as straight that are into trans women and for whatever mm -hmm. reason they're very attracted to them they like them there's something about it that turns them on but they will not admit it they mm -hmm. contact you from fake accounts they want to meet you like outside where they live and but they are very very interested in you sexually and mm -hmm. it, it, i mean like i said i if i put up a dating profile or something even if i say like i'm a trans woman interested in other women or whatever it will be flooded with 99 percent straight males wanting to get together for sex if you talk to anyone who, um, you know, has worked in the porn industry or anything with any of that stuff, they will tell you that trans porn is extremely popular. So there are a lot of people out there that are very into this idea of sex with trans women. But what happens in a lot of cases, they knowingly pursue these women. They want to have sex with them. When Then after they do, then, they, then now they're faced with what if someone finds out? And they are so terrified of the consequences in their own life of what will happen, how their friends, their family, their employers will react if they find out they're having sex with trans women, that they freak out and then beat her to death and claim that they didn't know. And this, and it doesn't always result in death, but it, in many cases it does. So this, yeah, so the, the false narrative, the idea that trans girls are out there trying to trick guys, and I'm not saying there's no trans woman out there that hasn't, that has fully transitioned and is 100% passable, and that has not been, you know, forthcoming about her situation before having sex and probably out of fear or is simply out of fear of being rejected. Mm -hmm. And personally, I wouldn't do that, but I'm not going to judge. And, you know, that's every person's own decision. But but this idea that trans girls are trying to trick men and straight men into having sex with them, not only is it, you know, largely false, it's also very harmful. 
And, and the sad part is there's a whole lot of people out there that would have amazing relationships with trans women, a lot of trans women that, you know, they want to be in relationships, they want to be loved and everything else. And these people could have amazing relationships together, but because of the transphobia, because of the discrimination, because of the stigma, there are so many people that want this, but are too afraid to do so. And, and very nasty and terrible things come out of it. And, 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 the, and the funny thing is too, a lot of trans women still like women too. Um, so it, this idea that trans women transition in order to get men, one third of the trans women are still attracted to women. So that's two thirds of the community, um, you know, based on the studies I've read, uh, end up dating men. But so it's not even like a thing that's exclusively um, mm -hmm. happening. But but yeah, but like I said, unfortunately, because of the consequences that come out of that, and the seriousness of it, I think that's the most harmful, like um, misleading narrative. Very interesting. Yeah, that's very interesting. Wow. Um, our next question comes from Faith Sutherland. Uh, she says, you mentioned being a Marine, which by the way, I also wanted to say thank you so much for your service. I actually didn't get a chance to say that at the beginning. Um, I have a, immense respect for you for that. So thank you so much. Um, she says, you mentioned being a Marine. Do you have any advice for people going in soon? Um, in, in just in general, or are we talking about trans people? Um, I don't know. I, I think this I person might just be going in in general. Yeah. I, I can address both. Okay. Well, unfortunately the way things are right now, if you're trans, you can't be either, you can't be open about it or you can't be in the military. Um, mm. you know, so as it stands currently, you can't be open and be trans and they, and, um, people that were already in and already out were allowed to stay, but anyone else, you're not allowed to join if you're open about it. And if you weren't open and you come out, they will dishonorably discharge you. So if you're currently trans, it's not an option for you, unfortunately, because there's a lot of trans people that have served our country very honorably. Yeah. And, uh, and just let everyone know, like all of the Marines I served with that I'm still very close to 100% across the board, every single one of them is very supportive of me. They, I mean, so many of the guys I served with have all reached out and there's not been one negative response. All of them support me 100%. So that's been really awesome. Um, as far as in general joining the Marine Corps, you know, it, it's an amazing organization that takes a ton of pride in what they do and being the best at what they do. Um, you form a bond with those people like nothing else. And like I said, these are guys I served with 25 years ago and they're still like family to me to this day. And I might not see them for years at a time. We get together and it's not like a minute has passed. Um, you know, go, go in there being ready to give 100%. Um, and, and expected 100% to be demanded of you. It, it's, a, it's a very different world from civilian life and um, very demanding, but very rewarding. And um, it, it's, it's something that not everybody's fortunate enough to do or willing to do. But uh, for anyone that does, they definitely have my respect and, and uh, they will always be a brother or sister of mine. Yeah. Wow. Well, Janae, I think we're going to probably wrap it up there. Um, thank you so much for coming on. Um, and thank you so much for for answering the questions, some of these questions from the audience. Uh, I think this was a really great conversation. I feel like I've actually learned a lot also. Uh, I certainly hope that the viewers did as well. Um, but thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for 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 uh, uh, giving up some of your time to be here tonight. Uh, do you have any closing remarks or anything? Um, you know, just thank you to, you know, for having me on, allowing me to, you know, share my story and to answer some of these questions and, and hopefully, you know, to help educate people and help them open their minds and, and just, you know, understand that, like I said, trans people are people like everyone else. Some of us are great people. Some of us are horrible. And to just understand that and, you know, and I, I just really hope that we can grow towards having a conversation about all this and, and work together to you know, do what's best for everyone. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here. And to everyone watching, uh, you can follow Janae's social media profiles down below. Um, I have her YouTube, Instagram, and her website linked. So thank you so much again, Janae, and you have a wonderful rest of your night. Thank you. Thank you so much.